Well, it's, it's a delight for me to be with you here this evening. Thank you so much for coming along, and thanks to George and the Oversight for their invitation to share in what I would always say is one of the most important meetings of a mission, which is the last night, week night of a mission. I count it a great privilege, and thank you so much for the opportunity, and I trust that George, wherever he is, is at peace in his heart, knowing hopefully that everything's under control here. And uh, we have been hearing great news of what the Lord has been doing here. We've been praying for you over in Newton Abbey, and uh, we've been thinking very much about it, and I get to be text at 12 o'clock to hear of another two souls has come to the Lord, and so we're going through it with you, and so delighted. And I'm a wee bit embarrassed, to be honest with you, because George picked up an old photograph of me, and he stuck it up on Facebook, and I had that many people looking for autographs, I had to come early from... <laughs> <laughs> I may get my hands on George, I'll alter his uh, facial expressions. Anyway, uh, but nevertheless, George is a dear soul, and him and I have been great friends for a long time, and uh, you are a privileged people to have the likes of George McConnell uh, around you in these days. He's a great man, he's a great heart for God, and I'm hearing of great things that he's doing here. Um, I am going to share my testimony, and my uh, testimony, as I've said, is what the Lord has done in my heart. I would have nothing to say if God hadn't worked in my heart. And I want to base uh, what I'm going to say tonight on a passage of Scripture. So if you want to turn with me, it's quite an unusual passage to launch your testimony, but it's found in Matthew chapter 27. And we find there a man who is faced with a, an awesome decision, an awesome decision, uh, which I found myself quite some years ago uh, faced with the same decision. Now, everything that I'm going to say is in this little book, A Little Child Shall Lead Them. Many of you probably have gotten it. I, Esther packed me up with a bag full of them before I came here tonight, and she said, don't you dare come home with one of them. So I have a bag full of these. Uh, a Little Child Shall Lead Them. They are priced at nine pounds, but if you haven't come prepared, George will pay for it anyway. <laughs> Anyway, do see me afterwards. And I have a young fellow called Matthew uh, Snoddy. Matthew, Matthew Skimmer Snoddy. Uh, Matthew plays for Crusaders. Have you ever heard tell of Crusa Crusaders? You have? Yes. He got saved in our church a few weeks ago, a few months ago. And uh, he is a young man that's on fire for God. He's also on fire on the football field as well. But I have him here tonight uh, to give me some company. And it will not be long to hear him out and about giving his testimony of what the Lord has done in his heart. And it's great to see and hear what God is doing, isn't it? Amen. Our God's not dead, you know. He's still alive and he's still in the business of saving precious souls. Turn with me please to Matthew chapter 27 and I'm going to read from verse 11 to verse 25. Matthew chapter 7. We're breaking in on this uh, uh, on, the, on Pilate's dealings with the Lord Jesus. He wanted like anything to let Jesus go. He, he found no fault in this man. He found him to be innocent. And, and there seems to me to be a liking in, in Pilate's heart uh, towards the Lord Jesus. And he has a real battle going on here. Perhaps just the same as the battle that's going on in your heart. This is not the first night that you're in the mission. And if it's the first night in this mission, maybe it's not the first night in our mission. And it's certainly not the first time you've heard the gospel. Somebody has presented you with the claims of Christ for your life and you found yourself in a place where you need to make a decision. And you'll be there tonight as well, if you haven't already been so. Pilate's in that exact same position. I found myself in this position in 1984, faced with a tremendous decision of what I was going to do with Christ. Let's read together Matthew chapter 27, reading in verse 11. And Jesus stood before the governor, and, go and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. And when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. And then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou how many things they witness against thee? And he answered him, To never a word, insomuch that the governor marveled greatly. Now at that now at that feast the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. And they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto him, unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. When he was set down on the judgment seat, 
his wife sent on to him saying have thou nothing to do with that just man for I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him but the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus the governor answered and said unto them whither of the twain will ye that I release unto you they said Barabbas Pilate saith unto them what shall I do then with Jesus which is called Christ they all unto they, they all say unto him let him be crucified and the governor said why what evil hath he done but they cried the more let him be crucified and when Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing but rather a tumult or in other words a riot was made he took water and washed his hands before the multitude saying I am innocent of the blood of this just person see ye to it then answered all the people and said his blood be on us and on our children amen and we trust that the Lord will bless that reading of his word and give us help to express what it is that the Lord has done in our hearts as I said to you way back in 1984 in fact many years before that I was faced with this challenge this choice this decision this awesome decision that I had to make and what I would do with Jesus I want to simply tell you that and tell you how God brought me to himself the things that he had to use the troubles and trials and devastation that he brought us as a family through so that he could soften down our hardened hearts and bring him to yourself to himself I was born in, in Monaghan in the south of Ireland not too far from Middletown the Middletown border I was born into a family now wait for it 11 children six girls five boys and I'm the best looking of them all that's what my wife tells me every morning when she wakens up and someone said she needs to go to Specsavers the, we were they were born into a three bedroom farming house in the south of Ireland there was mother and father and 11 children all living in a three bedroom house the first to bed got a bed and the last up got no breakfast and had to walk to school that was us and oftentimes we went half half dressed because somebody else had got their clothes on them that was us but in many ways I suppose we look back with some happy memories some difficult memories but one thing we didn't have was any thought of who God really was we were not brought to know or brought up to know God and we had no interest in the things of God we would, you would describe us being hillbillies we have been the kind of people that would come out from the cracks and crevices and scare the living daylights of you I had absolutely no desire for school or education and uh, oftentimes you'd find me hiding somewhere to, to try and not uh, go to school. Now I see my brother Ian's wife is here tonight and some of the stories I'm going to tell tonight are in connection with him because anything that <laughs> any, uh, most of my illustrations and preaching comes from my brother Ian. Our minister, we were brought up in a Presbyterian home and Presbyterian family, though we didn't go out that often to church. But now and again we did go. But our minister used to stand up in the pulpit and he said, I shall be visiting, and he'd go down the, through the different names of the townlands that he'd be visiting. And we lived in a place called Fadu, just not too far from Castlesheen and not too far from Monaghan. Well, now and again he'd stand up in the pulpit and he said, I shall be visiting Fadu this Tuesday afternoon. And he'd be, he'd be chewing away at marbles as well. He, he, used to, he used to drive a, a light bright lime green, uh, this is awful hard to say by the way, he used to drive a light bright lime green Hillman Hunter. Does anybody remember those old cars? Hands up, and you're in the early age pension as well aren't you? <laughs> of course you are. Well, he would drive a light bright lime green Hillman Hunter and we lived on the bit of a hill and my mother used to call the house Sally Mount. And we went up the top of the hill, you could see down at the crossroads. And whenever we could see the crossroads, which was about a mile away from our house, you'd see the light, bright, lime green Hillman Hunter coming to the crossroads. Ian got me into the wheelbarrow and wheeled me to the foot of the lane. And by this stage, he'd have me painted in red spots. Whenever we got to the foot of the lane, the minister would come to the foot of the lane and he'd say, What's wrong with Trevor? Chicken pox, Ian would say. The minister would turn the car back home, go back to the manse where he belonged. <laughs> that was success one more time. Because we didn't want this religious man next nor near us. He was away up there and we were nobodies. And that's how we felt. But now and again, I think he got a wee bit wise for us. 
and he stopped warning us. He stopped warning us that he was going to come to the house and one day we saw him coming along the lane. Our lane was quite a lot of potholes and he had to come nice and slow in his light, bright, lime green Hillman Hunter across the lane. And so that gave my mother time to get the house kind of tidy and get the Bible out on, on top of the sideboard, get the dust off it because we wanted him to think that we read the Bible all the time. I'd say there's one or two who would like to think that you're more religious than what you really are that's in this meeting tonight. And so he would go through the things, he'd talk about the weather, he'd talk about farming, he'd talk about everything, but he never challenged us about God and about our salvation. Well, life went very, very quickly by. I grew up and left school when I was 14, took my first pint of smelix when I was 15, and I bought myself a motorbike. I bought my motorbike on HP. Does anybody know what HP stands for? What does it stand for? You know, it means it'll never be yours. <laughs> because as, as soon as you've it paid for, it's done and you have to get a new one. That's the way it is. Well, whenever you got a wee bit of Dutch courage and got into your motorbike, I used to take my pints at Smithwick, and I'm not one bit proud by saying this, by the way, but that's is just my life. Whenever we went into Long Nancy's pub, we'd have a pint of Dutch courage, and behind Long Nancy's there was a bit of a hill, and at the bottom of the hill there was a humpback bridge, and on the other side of the humpback bridge was a bit of a corner, and on the other side of the corner there was a bit of a precipice. So when you've got uh, Dutch courage on your motorbike, turn down the hill as fast as you can, you hit the humpback bridge, and you know what? The law of gravity takes over, doesn't it? And you're airborne without a license. Well, that was me. Many, many times, and the, the thrill of this was that you landed on your side. Because if you didn't land on your side, you went over the precipice, over, uh, and, and who knows if it could have been to your death. Can I say that Hebrews chapter 1 and the last verse says, He shall give his angels charge over them that shall be heirs of salvation. I can only say that God kept his hand upon me because if I had uh, in some way came and met my death prematurely, I'd have been lost in a Christless hell. There was only one speed that I knew on a motorbike and that was flat out. I only broke the speed limit once when I got on the motorbike and that was going up past it. I can remember one time I was on this motorbike and I was coming up towards a bridge and I saw this lorry stopping in the middle of the road but I was going so fast I knew I was not going to get stopped. And so presence of mind took over and I put the motorbike down on her side and I slid away onto the, onto the lorry. And had I had my head above the, the, the tail of the lorry, I would have been decapitated. I would have been a headless preacher. And I'm sure you've met one or two of them before. <laughs> God keeping his hand. I remember one day we were going to join Clontibbert Pipe Band, an orange pipe band. And uh, we were going that fast that we came to a corner and the cows that hadn't been on the road before us and they'd left a foreign object in the middle of the road. I'm not going to give you any more description than that. When we came to the corner, we were going so fast there was no traction. And the motorbike, I could see my pillion passenger going through the hedge, head first. I didn't see, I saw, the last thing I saw of him was his feet and I haven't seen him since. <laughs> we were absolutely mad. There was no restraint, no restriction. We had no cares of this world. And we didn't even think that had we died, we would have been gone to a Christless hell, lost for all eternity. Every time I think of that, folks, I humble myself. I, I, I almost weep, break down and weep and I think how, how loving, how merciful, how long-suffering and how patient God was with me. Well, uh, when I was about 19 years of age, I met the best-looking woman in Ireland. And you know who that is, don't you? You thought it was you, Mrs., didn't you? <laughs> no, it was the wife, Esther. Within six months we were married, and we were living in a little apartment, a little flat in, in Glass Off Street in Monaghan. And then after a number of years, we went, away, went the way of all the world, and we tried by, by various means and bought ourselves a house. And that was about three or four years after we were married. Our second son was now on the road. Uh, and, and like all parents, you, you're, you're, you're planning, you're looking towards, and you have great expectation and anticipation of a healthy newborn babe gracing your home. Because every little life's a miracle of God's grace. Isn't that true? And of course, 
Esther had these kind of suspicions, but she never voiced them very much other than her and I would have a lot, an odd little private conversation. I can remember the day that Raymond was born. Uh, I had been chased home from the hospital by the nurses because they didn't allow the husbands to stay in those days. They would have a hard job putting me home today. Whenever I was on the way down towards the hospital to phone again to see, because this was a very long and laboured and drawn out labour, my brother Larry was coming running up the lane or up the road to say that the hospital had phoned. We didn't have a phone, but he had a phone. The hospital had phoned his house to say that I needed to get to the hospital fast. There were complications. When I got to the hospital, Esther was in floods of tears. She was very distraught and the hospital staff looked at each other quite puzzled because the moment that Raymond was born Esther turned to the midwife her name was Nan and she said to Nan he's down syndrome isn't he take him away that's how she reacted they can't to this day uh, understand how Esther knew he was down syndrome because they didn't know and they had to spend three days in tests before they found out of his condition. Esther will tell you in the book says that uh, she had a premonition all the way during that pregnancy. She will tell you today that God let her know, informed her, made her understand that he was Down syndrome. But then he, one day when he was still in the incubator in the hospital, he turned blue and he started coughing up blood. He was rushed up to Drogheda and we were in the, in the car right behind him all the way up to Drogheda and they discovered that he had a congenital heart disease as well. He had three holes in his heart. He had an enlarged heart and he had an enlarged liver and he had other various and very difficult complications. He was rushed up to the hospital and they gave him some medication and from then on for the next 17 months we lived with death in our house. We were a proud people folks. Though we didn't have much of this world's goods Though we didn't have an awful lot to claim by way of merit, nor did we have anything to brag about by way of success or ambition, we were a proud people nonetheless. I believe that God sent that young life, that's his pho photograph there, I believe God sent that little life to do a work in our hearts, a work that would never leave us the same again. Uh, for the next number of months we, we had to go to Dublin to do a, a special test with Raymond. They pronounced that he had a serious and inoperative, inoperative heart condition and they would never be able to do anything for him to save his life. I don't know if you've ever received that kind of news as a young parent. I suspect perhaps there are one or two in this meeting and you suffered something similar. You've had a miscarriage or a stillbirth stillborn and you're still suffering and still have memories I, I was I was uh, uh, I called up to the hospital two weeks ago in my own church a little Portuguese family they've all got saved in the church and the little boy David was up in the intensive care and I was called up and they, they weren't giving him much hope and so I rushed up to the hospital to pray with his mum and for the little David. And, and then I came back to church. This was Sunday morning and I came back. And uh, uh, before I preached, I said, I would like us all to stand and pray for David. I wasn't able to pray. I was brought back, away back to 19, uh, to the day whenever Raymond lost his little life. And as I saw that little boy just a couple of weeks ago, I saw my own son. Do you know what the good news is? David recovered and he's full, hale and hearty and he's well today. But you never get over the loss of a child. It's not a natural process. They're supposed to bury us. We're not supposed to bury them. My heart was broken, as was Esther's, but anyway, Raymond, Raymond lived. He had heart condition, he had, he had heart failure five times, he had pneumonia 17 times. He, had a, he was a very ill and uh, sick little boy. He had a very shallow breath and he had a very uh, pale reflection. I remember many occasions Esther phoning me. There was an emergency. Raymond's heart was in failure. And we were never offered from that moment on any ambulance service, mind you. And any time that Raymond had to go from Monaghan to Drogheda, which was 54 miles, 
I had to put him in a little blue Hillman Avenger and take him up the road with his mother nursing him, trying to keep him alive. When we got to the hospital, we, they would put him into a little oxygen tent. And because there was oxygen going into that tent, he would revive. When Raymond was one year old, he was able to put his hand up inside the tent and he would ask, not ask, but he, we knew what the next thing was, that we were to put our hands up on the outside of the tent. When we would do that, he would put his little head down and he would, I suppose in his heart, he was comforting his parents and we felt everything was all right. Even though the doctors only gave him five years, I never ever thought that we would ever lose our little son. I remember one occasion someone told us about a man called Sammy Workman. He was coming to Monaghan to conduct a mission. And so I said, we had tried everything. I said, we'll go and see Sammy. I was not interested in the gospel at this stage. I had never heard the gospel. I, I thought a mission was to little children in Africa. And so whenever we went up to Sammy, Sammy did something strange and unusual. He brought us into a little room and he said, Lord, you are sovereign Lord. You can do anything you choose to do. Lord, you could uh, heal this little boy. But then he prayed. And I, I was an unsaved man and I can remember it so well. He said, but Lord, would you not do a work in these young parents' hearts? And with that, he prayed for us and him. And we went off home again. Just the day before Raymond died, I, I got another phone call from Esther. Raymond's heart's in failure one more time. And so uh, I rushed home. I was a baker by trade and uh, trying to get the old bakery clothes removed and trying to get myself a kind of dressed up to head up to this beaten track up to Drogheda Hospital. And Raymond was sitting in a little white rug and he was coughing up uh, blood and his little skin was all blue prickles. And I was rushing up and down the sitting room and Raymond's eye caught my eye. And God spoke to me through the look of a child and here's what God said. What are you rushing around for? What's life all about? And folks, that sobered me. That was the first time that I seriously thought about life and death. God spoke to me through, a, through the look of a little child. It was the most powerful sermon that I've ever heard. And I sobered up in a moment. What was life all about? What was I rushing around for? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Have you ever wondered what your life is about? Do you think that you're just here to live and die like a dog and cease to exist? Do you think that you're placed on this earth just to satisfy and gratify your own flesh and lustful desires? Or is there a higher purpose? I want to tell you just as there's a purpose for that pen. God has a purpose for every life. I had never thought of this before. This was new to me. That God had a purpose for my life. And what had I done with it up until this point? Well, I was now 24 and a half years of age and I had wasted my life. What are you rushing around for? What is your life going to count for when you're gone? And so, we got Raymond into the little car. Esther was nursing him and praying outwardly even though we were not Christians. I could hear her says, Lord, keep him living, keep him living. And I was racing this car, still never having been. To this day, I don't know why we were never offered an ambulance service. But I was driving, and it was reckless, but we had only one desire, and that was to get Raymond to Drogheda, where we knew he would be safe, or at least thought so. We got Raymond into his little oxygen tent, and again, his little hand up on the inside of the tent, our hand on the outside of the tent. He put his little head down on the pillow and he was seeking to comfort us. And because we had another elder son at home, and because when you have sick children, your, all your finances go towards that sick child, I had to go home. We were six months behind in our mortgage for the house. The ESB, which is the equivalent to your NIE, were threatening to cut off the electric and I needed to go home and work and we had to look after a little boy and we didn't have any services of any kind to help us in this time of trouble.
maybe that's exactly where you are. Went home about 12 o'clock, ran out of petrol, pushed the car into a man called Ronnie McCarvels. He gave me five pounds worth of petrol and tick and got the car started again and went home, went to work, appeared the next day and Esther kept in touch with the hospital and then at half past three the hospital phoned the neighbour's house because we still had no phone, couldn't afford it and um, you need to come up, your little son's condition has deteriorated. Well we were trying our best as soon as I would get finished work and get home, we would be up that road as was our custom. And of course into the car, tearing up the road. We knew the road by this stage off by the um, uh, uh, off path. We knew it, uh, every crack and crevice and every corner and every difficult, we knew every part of this road. And we raced up the road and there's supposed to be a compassionate nurse that meets you in the, in the hospital whenever there's the, uh, the fatality or the death of a little infant. But for whatever reason she wasn't on duty when we arrived and we went to the bed that we left him the night before, seemingly safe and sound and doing well. But when we got to his little bed, he had already passed into eternity. He'd taken a massive heart attack as the nurse was, was working with him and he, he died instantly as the nurse were in, in a nurse's arms. We were angry, heartbroken, confused. There was a million um, emotions that stirred our hearts. Our little precious, though you might think handicapped child, the more dependent a child is on you, the more you love them. The more dependent a child is upon you, the more you love them. There's another element to that love that you cannot hardly discover until you come to a high dependent infant that's dependent upon everything and anything. Well, three or four days later, it was the time for Raymond's funeral. The house was packed because we have a large family and it was packed from, from the, to the rafters and there was never hardly time to think about who you were or what you were or where you were in your mind. But I do remember the day of the funeral. The Reverend David Hillen, the Presbyterian minister who is now a very close and dear friend, who is now retired, living in Limavady, he took the funeral service. He used that little title from, uh, from Isaiah 11, A Little Child Shall Lead Them. And he said, we cannot understand or can we fathom out or work out how come God has allowed this in their family. Can he, do you remember what I said now? God allowed it. He didn't send it. He allowed it. There's a difference between God sending heartache and allowing heartache. The Word of God says that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to His purpose. And remember at that funeral service he sought to explain how it was that this little boy and what perhaps what God may be doing through this. Perhaps he says God is trying to work on this young couple to bring them to himself. That was prophetic, wasn't it? Well, I can remember looking into the, into the grave. If you ever wondered what goes through the heart of a young parent as they look into the graves of their child where they're going to be placed, I said, Raymond, I know where you're going. I don't know where I'm going. That troubled me. I mean, I'd been baptized and catechized. I'd been dragged along to church and Sunday school occasionally, or as often as my mother could force me to go. I had seen religion at work, but it gave me no hope for the future. For 22 months, that little look of our son, what are you rushing around for? What's life all about? I know where you're going, but I don't know where I'm going. For 22 months, You'd have found me out walking the fields, four o'clock or half four, or maybe even earlier in the morning. Not all the time, but quite often. 
My heart was breaking. You'd see me, if you'd have been on the other side of the hedge. Now, I didn't let the family know. I didn't let anyone know. But if, you, if you'd have been on the other side of the hedge, and you're looking at me, and you saw me prancing up and down the field, shaking my fist at God, you'd say that poor man never got over the loss of his son, and never will. Never will. But I was seeking for some kind of sense to life. I was wanting to see some kind of uh, hope for the future and finding none. For 22 months I was lost. Lost in my grief. Lost in my anger. How dare God take our little son? How God dare let a little innocent child be taken without any hope of any kind of life? How dare God invade our home in this way? God was getting all the blame. All the blame. Maybe that's what you've done. You blame God for some of the things that have happened in your home and in your family. When all the time it's not God's fault. And if God has allowed something to happen in your heart and in your home, then he's allowing it for a reason. And not until you bow your knee and trust in Christ will you ever discover what that reason truly is. Well, after 22 months... I was in the, sit in the sitting room of her own home in 24 Tully in Monaghan. I was listening to a record by Jim Reeves. I can't for the life of me understand where I picked it up, but I don't know who gave it to me. I could possibly have stolen it. I don't know. The LP was called We Thank Thee. On that LP there were two songs. I'd rather have Jesus in silver or gold. And the other was Have Thine Own Way, Lord. Have Thine Own Way. Esther was away at a, a meeting for foster parents because we had now at this stage become foster parents. And so I was minding now our foster daughter whose name is Nicola now living in Drogheda and also my eldest son Darren. And I started listening to these two songs. Do you remember the old vinyl LPs? Do you remember them? Do you remember the old arm of the, of the LP? and you, you played it over then you lifted it back and you played it over. You're nearly as old as me. And, and I started listening to these two songs and I played them over and over and over and over again and the next thing God started to work in my heart I felt at that stage that I was the only sinner that was ever born in fact as a teenager I had a fear of dying and going to hell but by this stage as I listened to these two songs I, I came to the place where I realized that hell was too good for me I realized that I deserved to be lost I had neglected and rejected God all my life and I had been angry with him for almost two years and, and now I'm discovering that, that God had loved me all this time and he was angry at my sin. I got down on my knees just uh, beside the sitting room, beside the city. And I said, Lord, I don't know how to become a Christian. I've seen plenty of hypocrisy, but I really don't know how to become a Christian. But all I know is that I need you. I need you to fix this broken heart. I need you to change this angry, perverted life. And I want to tell you, look at me when I say this, because it is as significant and as instant as this. In a moment, the moment I opened up my heart, his grace flooded in. And I was changed in a moment. And I was so changed that I was never ever the same since. And nor has my life ever felt, I've never ever felt like going back into the world. I, I was spoiled to the world and I was supernaturally altered by the divine power of God and I have been singing his praises ever since I went into work the next day I still worked in this bakery and I was singing he lives he lives Christ Jesus lives today he walks with me I to this day do not know where I learned that song still don't remember, I don't know how I learned it and they were looking at me at work as if Galandas, Galandas has got religious and then they started taking bets to see how long it would last I think they've lost all their bets I'd say God had changed and then all of a sudden light flooded my soul and I became I said why did I not do this long ago, what was I afraid of who was I afraid of <coughs> and so 
Uh, God started working on my heart. I started getting desires for the things of God, for the scriptures. I started getting the desire. By the way, three days later, Esther herself came to Christ as well. Uh, she says, it's her testimony, I'm not going to give it for you. Uh, uh, but uh, by the way, I, mar I asked her to marry me on my first date. Did you hear that? Fellas, if you want to know how it's done, see me after the meeting. <laughs> and God began to work in our home. I can remember uh, he challenged me, God challenged me to take a little New Testament to work. Um, so I got myself, remember the half tin of biscuits? Isn't it interesting to see those half tin of biscuits so they're getting smaller every year, aren't they? Well, there used to be a half tin of biscuits was a full tin of biscuits then, now. And, and I got my few wee sandwiches, I got my wee drop of milk, I got my wee uh, tea bag, and I got my wee mug, and I got my wee New Testament into that box. You see, whenever you're brought up the way I was brought up, you're gro greatly embarrassed about God. That's what we were. You wouldn't even carry your Bible to church because everybody would be talking about you. And so I got my new New Testament, we New Testament, into my box and come lunchtime. It wasn't to preach to the boys at work. It was just to read God's word during my lunch break. Well, I was so painfully embarrassed. I used to get the tin off the box and I used to get my sandwiches out and I used to get my head into the wee box. And I used to say, Galanda's is hungry the day again. <laughs> I was hungry, but I was hungry for God. If I hadn't have obeyed God there, I wouldn't be standing before you now. It is no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he'll do for you. With arms wide open, what's the rest of it? He's calling you. It is no secret what God can do. My life has been eternally altered by the grace of God. I would ever give him praise because I knew at that moment whenever I trusted him that Christ had died on the cross in my stead and for me. That it was no merit that I had ever done and nothing of value that I had ever achieved but purely and simply because Christ had loved me and he loved me so much that he gave his life for me. Now let me take you way back way back to that sitting room where I was listening to Jim Reeves and where I was confronted with this, this question that Pilate uh, was, uh, was, was uttering verse 22 and I'm going to be seven minutes exactly what shall I do with Jesus which is called the Christ what was going through my mind what was going through my heart? I suspect the same things that was going through Pilate's heart. Pilate was faced with an awful decision. What shall I do with Jesus? You can hear the pain. You can hear the agony. You can, you can almost feel it. What am I going to do with Jesus? I'm reminded of a story of a man who was walking past a, a, a river. He had twin sons walking with him and the, both of them walked too close to the edge of the bank and both of them fell in. The father was just an ordinary swimmer, not a great swimmer. But his twin sons had now fallen into the fast flowing river and that father was faced. Which son am I going to save? To choose one was to lose the other. He'd have to live with that choice for the rest of his life. That's exactly how Pilate felt. What am I going to do? Have you ever wondered what it is that's behind that awful battle that's going through your heart? Is it because you haven't fully understood the significance, the importance of the decision that's placed before you? For Pilate, he could not have known the significance of the choice. For him, it was one of a universal and eternal choice. Now, for you, it may not be universal, but I want to tell you it is an eternal decision. What shall I do? Is that what's ringing through your heart? He was faced with a decision. 
Would you have liked to have been in Pilate's shoes that day? And yet every time you come to a gospel meeting and you're faced with the claims of Christ, you are in exactly the same position because there's no middle ground. You either accept him or you reject him. There's no other choice. I remember being in a gospel campaign. This is meat and this is bread and water to me. This is milk and bo bread and butter to us. This is what I was brought up in preaching the gospel. Ten campaigns. I love them. I can remember one tent campaign, this young man who was a, smoked a hundred cigarettes a day. And I can remember Esther made an illustration or she made this challenge. If you want to trust Christ tonight, she says, as you walk down the aisle, you choose which hand you're going to shake me with. And if you're going to shake me by the right, ha the right hand, which is the normal hand, I know you're rejecting him. But she says, if you want to shake me by your left hand, then I know that you want to trust him. And I can remember Andy coming down the length of that tent. And I can remember when he got from here to Willie John, he started looking at his hands. I could see the anxiety. Which hand am I going to shake? And we thought that he was going. You could see it literally happening in the tent. And as he came closer to Esther, we could see the battle. And as he almost stepped forward, we could see him reaching forward. And he reached with his left hand and was born again. And his life was utterly changed. We had a woman walked into church just recently. She's from a Muslim background, a Tur from Turkey. And here's how she got converted. She says, I met Jesus as I read the Bible. It's that simple. You're faced with a choice. Make no mistake. It's either yes or no. It's not a maybe, because maybe is to reject. Someday is to reject. Putting it off until tomorrow is to reject. In fact, it's the greatest sin of all. To put off until tomorrow what you should be doing today. Because if you knew that you should be doing it today, you know you're doing wrong by rejecting it. Faced with a decision. I'll tell you what else. He was faced with a religion. It was the religious men that presented Jesus before these people. It was religion that put Christ on the cross. And you've been saying, I'm a deacon, or I'm an elder, or I'm a, I'm a church warden, or I'm, I'm a physician in the church, and my church doesn't preach, you need to be born again. If your church doesn't preach, you need to be born again, they need to start. Except a man is born again, he never entered the kingdom of heaven. One of my choices, I've been brought up Presbyterian and I was, I was fighting this battle because I was baptized as an infant and I've been taught the catechism, I was taught to wipe my nose and, and say my prayers and polish my shoes and comb my hair and go to church and everything will be alright. Is that the battle that you're doing? Not only was he faced with a decision, not only was he faced with a religion, but he was also faced with a rebellion. Rather, a tumult was made. All hell was against Pilate making the right choice. All hell is against you making the right choice. You know that you've got an enemy. Those wandering thoughts that's going through your head now. Those issues that you're putting, that the devil is putting before you. If I become a Christian, then the Lord will laugh at me. If I become a Christian, then my husband will get mad. If I become a Christian, it's going to cost me all that back pay and tax. If I become a Christian, I'll not be able to keep it. If I become a Christian, I'll not be able to show it. My dear friend, every voice that you're hearing that's telling you to put it off is a voice from the devil. I remember one day we were prepared in the hall. I'm almost finished now. I remember we were in the, in the hall, in, in a wee orange hall in Tobin Moor, and uh, it was a big high ceiling in this orange hall, and we used to use, uh, used to have got very fancy heat in here, uh, and, and make sure that you're well. This is a sauna in here tonight, isn't it? <laughs> and, and come here and lose weight. You don't need to go to the, the health spa. Um, but we, we were, we were in, the, in, in the Tobin Moor in an orange hall, and, and uh, I was going to ring me at about four or five super shares and I was going to make sure that they're all pointing the right way because if you're getting hit full in the face with a super share heater, you know what'll happen. <laughs> That's what happens, isn't it? Gas will put you to sleep. 
and, and so, so, uh, so I was making sure they wouldn't be hitting anybody full in the face, making sure that the tanks were good and heavy uh, uh, and right. And I was right beside this super sir heater, and we opened the seal and there's this bulb, and it just shot to me, just shot down to the ground a bit, and it hit the floor about a half an inch from my feet, and I said, you devil, you missed. <laughs> all hell, all hell. Listen, who knows but you're a battle to get here tonight. We battle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickednesses in high places. You've got an enemy and his, and his name is the devil. And he hates your soul and he longs for your worship and he's crying for you to follow him. And he'll give you, he'll give you all the pleasures of this world to make sure he gets you over the precipice into a lost eternity. He's faced with a decision. Let me finish this, this, this little thought. I think it's worthy. He was also, you know, not only do we see Pilate's awful dilemma, we see his actual decision. You see, he gave in to the pushing and the persuasion of the people. Let's read it. They pushed him into this decision. The people that you work with. The people that you share your home with. Oh, they're doing this. And if I become a Christian, I couldn't do that. And their opinions this and their opinions that. And there's nothing to this our religious life. You forget about it and go out and enjoy yourself. They can laugh you into hell, but they'll never laugh you out of it. There's plenty of entertainment on the way to hell, but there's none there. He gave in to the pressures of the people. Notice very quickly, verse 19, he ignored the pleading of his partner. She says, have thou nothing to do with this just man? She had a dream. God had warned her. Maybe you've heard your pastor pray for you. Maybe you've heard your partner pray for you. Maybe someone has witnessed to you. Maybe someone has told you you need to be right with God. He ignored the pleading of his partner. He gave in to the pressure of the people. And you know what else he did? He even went against his own personal preference. I find no fault in this man. The number of people that I have heard say this to me, I know I need to be saved. In fact, I know I want to be saved. But I just can't do it. And what is it you're trying to do, Mrs? Because he does it all. And as that young man in 24 Tully and Monon doing that battle in my heart, I can remember the struggle. I can remember the fun that we used to poke at Uncle Cecil and other Christians when they used to do gather at the at the street corner and do their open air sh we, we used to mock them because they said all oh, that drink should be through in the river and we'd sing shall we gather at the river where all the free drink is <coughs> and I can remember saying Lord I, I remember saying to myself I know the fun that I poked at, at Christians and I know that fun will be poked at me can I ask you tonight what are you going to do with Jesus? Which is called the Christ. I know this is probably something you've heard many, many times, but I really, really, really mean this when I say this. I wish I had another thousand lifetimes to live for him. I would give it all to him again. And that's not a religious man that's talking. That's a sinner that's been saved by grace. And he can save your soul as well. At our little son's funeral, I don't know why we cho chose this hymn. I think we heard it at a mission that was held in a church and we'd attended one meeting. And we had this song sang, I hear 
thy welcome voice that calls me Lord to thee for cleansing in thy precious blood that flowed on Calvary. I am coming Lord, coming now to thee. Wash me, cleanse me in the blood that flowed on Calvary. Strange hymn for a funeral, we'd heard it at a mission, but now we know the full impact and full import of it as we read these words now. I wonder as we sing it just now, we're going to sing number 39. I want you to be as quiet as you can. Don't click the old handbags, they make an awful noise. And I want you to think about the words of this hymn. I want you to think about your choice and decision. And I want you to think, am I going to come to Christ or am I going to remain in the doldrums and in the wilderness for the rest of my life? You know, God's stirrings and strivings will not always continue with man. You could be almost into the kingdom and be lost. Judas was one of those. Seek the Lord while he may be found. You make that decision as we stand and sing this hymn. And you'll have opportunity to speak with me at the end as you leave the tent. And there's a little room at the back there where we can pray with you, pray for you. I can't save you, by the way. That may disappoint you. But I know someone who can. And his name is Jesus. Don't miss it tonight, folks. Don't miss it. Whatever you do. Thank you, sister.